And with us now to talk the Fed and all of this week's developments on trade and so much more is Trump's National Economic Council Director, Larry Kudlow. You couldn't have waited an hour, Larry, and come on and told us? <laughs> Somebody stole it from Somebody a, a pre-tape that's not going to play for a while, but you know the game as well as I do. Well, that is quite a statement. So, first of all, when did you change or, or decide that a 50 basis point rate cut is, is appropriate here? Well, look, um, I am echoing the president's view He's um, not been bashful about that view. He would also like the Fed to cease shrinking its balance sheet. And I concur with that view. Uh, looking at some of the indicators, I mean, the economy looks fundamentally quite healthy. We just don't want that threat. Uh, there is no inflation out there. So I think the Fed's actions um, were probably overdone. I mean, let me make a point here. Th this is our view. This is his view. This is my view. Federal Reserve's independent central bank, they're going to do what they're going to do. But um, somebody asked me, and I responded to it. <laughs> so what has changed on the ground then that warrants, you said, if the economy is fundamentally healthy, we're, I mean, this would be a pretty big move to all of a sudden, interest rates aren't that high to begin with. We're only at, what, two and a quarter to two and a half percent. Mm. We just raised four times last year. So are you saying that the Fed made a huge policy mistake last year or did something dramatically change where you think it's almost an emergency that we cut rates by that no. much this quickly? There's no emergency. It's just a point of view. OK, I mean, I watch yield curves I have for a long time. Uh, tens to bills are actually negative, slightly inverted. Uh, commodity prices, commodity index took a big whack uh, in the fourth quarter and earlier this year. Um, this is not an emergency. This is not anything. This is just our point of view. Um, frankly, think they went too far. But again, the Fed is independent. I respect the Fed. They will do so, what they're going to do. It's just that, look, globally, there's a lot of weakness out there. Europe, your zone, virtually in a recession. Um, China, very, very, very soft as we negotiate our trade. Troubles in Latin America. We don't want to threaten this great recovery. You know, basically, the president has in effect, redesigned and redeveloped and re-engineered this economy with lower tax rates and a big rollback in regulations and opening the door to energy again and also uh, trade deals that I think will be very pro-growth. We don't want to jeopardize that. We've got more people working than ever. We've got remarkably low un unemployment across the board, including, Kelly, I might say the biggest contributor to the labor force last year was women and all the minority categories. This is a terrific story. Blue collar workers, we haven't seen this kind of thing since the uh, late 1980s. Wages are rising. We want to keep it that way. And in the absence of inflation, with some of these global threats, um, our view is um, at some point, I don't know about the immediately, that may be a misquote, but at some point, um, I wouldn't mind seeing the Fed drop their target rate. So let me, let me, you, you know, I've known each other long enough for me to ask uh, the occasional impolitic question, and, and maybe this one is, or maybe it isn't. If you and the president and his nominee to the Fed, Mr. Moore, think mm -hmm. that, that interest rates ought to be a half point lower, mm -hmm. it sounds like you're saying you want that protectively, not because you see the economy in a current stall. I think that's very fair. I, in fact, I think that's exactly right. Okay. It's a protective measure. It's protective, not because no. you're worried that the economy is slowing. That is, is correct. Is the economy slowing? I don't think so. I don't think the underlying economy is slowing. In fact, even... What does that mean, the, the underlying? The fundamental economy, consumption and business investment, C plus I. That's the fundamental economy. Looks very good. I mean, even, for example, in the fourth quarter, we got a small markdown. There are all kinds of glitches here with winter seasonals and government shutdowns. But I noticed... Business capital spending was very solid. Consumer spending was solid. Here's one point. I think a lot of people are surprised not only how low inflation is, but in fact that inflation has been coming down in the last year. A lot of prices have been coming down. Yes, and you see it in the, you know, the Fed's measure of the PCE deflator and so forth, total and core. And I think that's a surprise. And, and therefore, the increases in rates, and, and by the way, I'm not... I'm not here to jump at the Fed or criticize the Fed. This is just our view, it's my not, view. It, I mean, there would be cynics out there, Larry, who would say, well, what they're doing is if protectively in case the economy does fall, they're setting up a blame the Fed um, I, scenario. I, I'm worried about protecting 
the best economic growth in several decades. I really, that, as President Trump rebuilds the economy, we don't want to endanger that. And we are, as everyone else in the world is, aware of some of these external threats from around the world. We, everybody's coming to the USA. Direct investment, portfolio investment, we're the hottest game in town. We don't want to jeopardize that. So let me ask you it in a different way then, Larry. If we do not get a 50 basis point cut at some time, do you believe that global economic weakness will in fact cause a slowdown here in the United States? Well, I don't think that um, the rest of the world can overwhelm the U.S. In fact, usually my view is, my, continues to be, we are the driver. We are the engine, okay? If we're doing well, that's going to help the rest of the world, all right? But I will say, there's no question, when you look at Europe, particularly big trading partners, and Canada, and parts of Latin America, and Asia, and China, we are, you know, wary of that. We're concerned about that. So I see this more as actions to protect the great economic re-emergence that we have. You know, we haven't had job numbers, employment numbers, wait wage numbers. Uh, here's another one. Coming out of the woodwork is what I'm calling it. You've got, if I get these numbers right, 7.3 million job openings, according to the BLS JOLTS numbers, and roughly 6.5 million people unemployed. Well, how do you match that? Well, people are now moving from unemployed discouragement back into the labor force. It's really quite remarkable, seldom seen. Uh, most of the experts miss that. I don't want to jeopardize that. So, and they're coming back as wages are rising, which is important. And also, our administration, I want to give my colleague Ivanka Trump some credit here, we've emphasized reskilling and retraining workers, not by the government, but private businesses, because they need the help. So, so you, I, you, I, don't want, I don't want tight money to interfere with that. That's you what I'm You say the saying. fundamental economy is not slowing right now, not what you see. A lot of others see it slowing a little bit. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I'm sure you know that. You've said in a sort of full-throated way, you see this as a 3% year. I do. You still? Yes, I you do. You still do. What we if... won't get it in Q1. We don't no. get it in Q1 because we never get the seasonal adjustments right. And, and you had we a did have a government had a shutdown. shutdown. And I wish the Commerce Department would get the seasonal adjustments right. Otherwise, I might have to turn them all into condominiums. It's a beautiful building, <laughs> as you know. But sure, every year for the past seven or eight years. But as we get into the spring quarter, I think, yes, we will resume 3% so, growth. So if you're not worried about slowing growth, then you're not worried by extension that that slowing growth is going to turn into a situation where the tax cuts that you helped architect uh, are not going to be able to pay for themselves over time. In other words, if the economy... That, that thought that the, that the tax cuts are going to pay for themselves is predicated on the idea that they're going to spur growth and that the economy is going to grow at 3% or above. Correct? I know you've never heard me say this before. Never, ever, I'm sure. Growth solves a lot of problems. Yes, it does. Okay? Growth solves employment problems. Growth solves corporate business problems. Growth solves budget deficit and debt problems. You know, growth is absolutely essential. If you... Listen to the president talk. He says this all the time. Growth, growth, growth. And uh, I'm delighted that he has that We had good view. growth last year, but tax revenues inbound did not grow. Pretty flat. Well, actually, overall, I think overall... You'd expect them to grow. Tax revenues were... Uh, I believe they were positive. I may be By wrong about... By four-tenths of a yeah. percent or Corporate something. Corporate tax that revenues depends. fell because of the immediate yes. impact. However... We will see those tax revenues start picking up as a consequence of the better growth. You have to take a cash hit initially, but the incentive effect is growing the economy. This is a supply side driven economy. This is not aggregate demand. This is not one time tax rebates. People say it's a sugar high and that's right. it. Nonsense. We lowered marginal tax rates. For everybody across the board, the biggest ones were for business, long overdue to make us competitive, both large and small companies. Just now, that process of uh, re-incentivizing the economy, that process is going to go on for many years. Remember, think of this this way. The big companies take a while to turn around their long-term investment plans. Now, we had a good start in 2018. 
a lot of people anticipated it in late 2017. I don't think that process is finished. No, and the expensing provisions don't disappear. That's correct. Either. Corporate tax rate doesn't disappear. And we're also seeing a phenomenal increase in repatriated overseas revenues and profits. That's one of the... But not $4 I, trillion. I was Well, hang on a second. I was just looking at some of those numbers. It's a lot. On a cash basis, I think the Joint Tax Committee estimated year one we might get $100 billion or so. It's We're getting like $750 billion yeah. and still rolling. So that's a, another sleeper factor. All I'm saying is we want open that throttle, open that throttle. Don't cut. There's no inflation going on here. But let me just and close the loop, Larry. More people uh, uh, on the you, Fed. And one, one last point. I just yeah. This is coming from the supply side. Yeah. All right. More people working at higher wages with higher productivity. One of the benefits yeah. here, one of the knock-on benefits, is productivity is close to two percent. More people working more efficiently at higher wages is a terrific thing. So let me a just close the loop thing. on the and Fed the here before. And the Federal Reserve should not tighten so, just because of prosperity. So how unhappy is the president with Chair Powell at this rate? Well, look, he's had his views on uh, Chair Powell. They had dinner together. Uh, I couldn't make the dinner. Um, he's our chairman. We're not going to displace him, things of that sort. So I don't want to get into any of the personalities. Is he unhappy involved. with the Treasury Secretary as a result of all this? I, I, Steve Mnuchin has been a terrific Treasury Secretary, he's one of the president's closest advisors and friends. So the answer to that is, I believe, no. Uh, Larry, I want to ask you about that 50 basis point cut again, because the markets, as you had mentioned yourself, so fixated on the inversion of the yield curve, yes. especially when it comes to the tens and bills, three months. You, you cut 50 basis points, and that inversion goes even deeper. Are you saying it doesn't? Deeper? I mean, it's... It... I think you go positive. Now, you know, immediately this and that, I, I'm not here to talk. That's the Fed's job, okay? Maybe so the 10-year will hold on to the yield, and we'll, well only move the short end. Well, I think so. I mean, I, and I might be wrong on this, uh -huh. okay? But look, um, globally, bond rates are so low. You know, big countries like Germany, where are they? Zero, Japan. negative mm -hmm. bond rates. And I think that's had a big impact on our market. So, I, again, there's no panic here. There's no emergency. But when you see an inversion, that's an old model, New York Fed model. It says a year ahead, you've got to start worrying about a downturn. We're not there yet. We're not a year ahead. Mm -hmm. But it's something you have to watch. I believe in watching market price indicators, and that's one of them. Uh, and, again, the big surprise, I guess, to many people, uh, not so much myself, but this is supply-side tax cut and a supply-side economy. So you're producing more investment, more capital formation, more goods, and more jobs. That is not inflationary. So therefore, you have to kind of recalibrate your thinking about interest rates. But it is up to the Fed. I, I'm not here to criticize Fed. I'm just saying this is our point of view. U.S.-China trade talks wrapped up in Beijing and continue next week in D.C. Treasury Secretary Steve Mnuchin tweeting today that negotiations were constructive. But former White House strategist Steve Bannon was on Squawk Box this morning saying don't expect a deal anytime soon. I think we're a ways away from that. If you look at the, uh, the, two, the back and forth on this, I think the Chinese are, are digging in, and I think some of the hawks in China are starting to dig in and say, hey, it'd be nice if we had a deal, but a no deal is better for us than a bad deal. So it's, uh, I think we've got a long way to go before we get a trade deal. Back with us is Larry Kudlow, National Economic Council Director. You've been deeply involved in these trade talks with China. You were very optimistic a couple of weeks ago. Are you as optimistic today? Yeah, look, we are still making good headway, including these talks. Now, those two fellows, Mnuchin and Lighthizer, are, I think they're still on the airplane coming home. But uh, the last message we got is they made more headway. They've been making headway uh, through teleconferencing and whatnot. Um, this is the kind of thing you got to take a day at a time, a week at a time. So they've been over there. They're coming back. Li Yuhei and his team, the Chinese team, will be here next week. We will continue those discussions. But w there are some market participants who wonder, Larry, if the reason why you're calling for a half a percentage point rate cut is because you, not you, the administration needs more time on the China deal. Would you be calling for that if you thought, hey, this thing is happening and it's imminent? Or is it because we're hearing no. now maybe June or later until it happens? Uh, no linkage, frankly, no linkage. And I don't want to get it. The timetable thing is, 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 a, is, a, is a bad exit off the highway anyway. I mean, what we want is 
a really great deal for the United States. That's been the president's view from day one. And we've made terrific headway. I mean, this is the largest scale, deepest discussion of trade between the two countries ever. And if an agreement is there, uh, it will be an historic agreement that will be pro-growth for both countries and the rest of the world. But it has to be done right. And that includes, you know, Bob Lighthizer is a brilliant trade guy. It's, the enforcement issues have to be done properly, the IP theft, the uh, forced transfer of technology, the cyber hacking, the commodities, the tariffs, the non-tariff barriers. Got to be right for the USA and whatever the timetable is. And I think, frankly, if you look at it, you know, a little patience isn't a bad thing. It's been less than a year uh, in this uh, round. And we went there. They're coming here. Uh, that's a good sign. These are all very Do positive tariffs. signs. But it is not related to the interest rate discussion, at least in my mind. Do tariffs come off if a deal is reached? How, do, how should we look at tariffs in terms of being a punitive measure, perhaps, uh, if, if enforcement is not there on the deal? You know, Melissa, those issues will be part of the enforcement mechanism. And as uh, Bob Lighthizer has testified, there's a multi-tiered enforcement mechanism. You know, complaints will be dealt with on the ground at a deputy's level and then at a principal's level. Um, the trick here is, first of all, if the United States is not satisfied, we will use tariffs. The president, I think, has taught all of us that tariffs uh, are very important in these negotiations. On the other hand, if you have a complaint, let's fix the complaint on the Chinese side. Uh, regarding tariffs themselves in general, uh, I don't want to go really through that. There'll be, there'll be discussions and there'll be decisions made. The president has said publicly, and I think that's the key point, we are not going to withdraw all our tariffs. We are not. Now, would some be withdrawn? I don't really want to get into that. Uh, these things are done as a matter of the negotiations. That's up to Mr. Lighthizer. Could we see at some point, let's say, you know, after the deal is done, a point where the tariffs would be higher at that point than they are currently? In other words, if they don't in a stick good to deal? their... In a deal? If they, if, in a deal if, that we exactly, sign? If, if we, right, exactly. If they don't stick to it, uh, and oh. the enforcement mechanism is such that tariffs will actually be higher if, than what they are now. If they don't stick to it, there will be significant risks there. Significant right. risks. If they do stick to it, then those risks will be ameliorated. I think that's just a matter of common what, sense. What have you learned in the past year, not just generally, but about tariffs and their, and their utility? Well, I will tell you, as a free trader, confirmed free trader, I really think the president has taught me and a lot of other people that tariffs have an important use in trade negotiations. You can get through the intransigence. I mean, if, you, if your goal is free, fair, and reciprocal trade, if you believe, as he does, that in a pure world we should have zero tariffs and non-tariff barriers and subsidies, you got to get there. And a lot of the world trading system is broken down. The WTO has not done its job. Uh, we believe, again, China has been, uh, you know, in in uh, non-compliance in many different areas. Others believe that too. Europe and Japan joins. So tariffs play a role. And I think I've learned that and I've watched it and particularly in the Chinese negotiations. That's probably the best example, all right? But what about the president was the, tough on China with the, tariffs. The, we, we, we hurt China economically. Yeah. They're already on the downslope. But here we are, deep into negotiations that, you know, perhaps will turn out very well. So that's one of the things I've learned, all right? I, uh, yeah, I admit... Because, because you have I, been I know a, where you're going. a unrepentant I, I, trader. I am now involved in it, hands-on, real world. I'm not the purist I once was. And the president's a pretty good negotiator. That's what I've learned. Just on the issue of tariffs, um, the Mexican-Canada agreement... Is at risk of stalling in Congress, according to the Washington Post, because of Chuck Grassley, who wants the president to lift steel and aluminum tariffs on those two countries as a precondition to the vote and says Trump will have to give in on that in order to get this thing passed. Well, look, um, Bob Lighthizer is, you know, heavy into that. First of all, let me say one thing. The USMCA deal is really an important deal. It sort of gets overshadowed now by the China thing. Uh, if you go into that deal in terms of domestic content and wages. If you look at that deal in terms of the new economy, breakthroughs, 
uh, IP protections we've never had, financial services inroads, biologic inroads, digital inroads. I mean, uh, we're finally getting through on the dairy farm stuff to help our farmers. It's really a good pro-growth deal. Currency stability. I mean, this really is, as, as Lighthizer says, it's a template for a lot of deals. Now, to your point, uh, Kelly, he is negotiating with Canada and Mexico uh, regarding tariffs and quotas. And I don't want to get in the middle of the the outcome will be determined. He's aware of the issues. He's aware of the pressures. Uh, but we're, you know, we'd like to do that deal. But again, it's like any other deal, it's got to be right. It's got to be right for the USA. USMCA is a really important thing, and we uh, ask help from everybody to get that thing passed. It really would be good for growth. It's a terrific thing. Larry, it's been a pleasure. Larry, good to see you again. Thank you, folks. All right.